I am an only child. Uh, my mother had two other children in childbirth that died in childbirth. Um, uh, so I'm the only one here. I think sometimes my mother blames me for that because I'm the only one who survived. It's a problem. Sometimes it, it comes across as a problem. Um, my father uh, was the first African-American salesperson at IBM, not Cory Booker's dad. I have, I have proof of that. I always get upset when I hear him say that. Um, my mother was a uh, trailblazer, one of the people that was sent in to uh, make a difference when she walked in the door. She's 86 years old now, but uh, she, was, she speaks Russian or does Russian. I don't know if she speaks anymore, but she, she, she worked at Bobtail Memorial Institute. She's one of the first women to integrate uh, in the military uh, places that she went into. Um, so she was primarily one of the door openers, one of the people who has, you know, asked if she ever had a tail, can I feel your hair, that kind of stuff. So my mother has a great deal of uh, anger. I found that my father um, was the buffer in our, in our family for my mother from the rest of the world. Um, I don't have that, so I have no buffers, and I have very few filters. I have my mother's anger, uh, and every once in a while I have my father's compassion and understanding. So it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a mix. Um, I grew up in East Detroit until I was a little over five, then went to East Columbus, uh, where I drank from my first time I ever drank from a white on a water fountain and got to receive a spanking or a paddling for drinking from a white on a water fountain because I didn't understand what that meant. I was not aware that Detroit was a segregated city because where I lived at the time when I was in Detroit, it had 600,000 black people in the inner city in the outer core had 1.4 uh, million white people. So we only dealt with black people on a constant basis. So when I went to Columbus, suddenly I was in an integrated school and it had a white only water fountain. Didn't understand what that meant. It was white, I drank from it, got a paddling. I've carried that with me ever since. Um, I, I went in the military, I went to an all black high school. I was kicked out of all black high school, went to an all white high school almost all white high school till myself and about 12 other of us went out there. That school has now been integrated. It's been gentrified um, because the black people moved in, the white people moved out kind of situation in that high school. I went to Ohio State. I did a year there. Um, told a teacher that, that a professor that he was teaching me too slow, that I couldn't deal with it because he was too slow just as it was in school. I stayed in trouble in school, so I stayed in trouble in, in college. And I stayed in trouble in the military. I did 10 years in the military. I was a military training instructor, uh, an air traffic controller, uh, a job controller. I received a um, associate's degree in uh, avionics. Uh, I've excelled at everything academically. Every time somebody's put something in front of me, I've excelled at it. Um, so I excelled in the military. Uh, but then I realized it was too slow for me again. I got out, started a restaurant, started two nightclubs. Uh, became an air traffic controller on the outside for a second, or air, air, uh, air, air training, what was it, air, aircraft dispatcher. I had that license. I then went into train dispatching. I did that for several years. I've been in a lawsuit for the last 18 years with the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad, uh, which I'm still um, suing them now, trying to get several other civil organizations involved in that process. Very difficult. Um, I'm the convener for the Great Panthers of Texas right now. Uh, I'm a former president of the Black Austin Democrats, rebuilt that organization. Uh, when I joined them, they had five members. Uh, within a year's time, we had over 80 active members. Uh, and then the Democratic Party found out that we were active as black people and came and dismantled that process. So, and what I've been doing for the last 12 years is dealing with children with the program of Youth Unlimited. So I have a bunch of kids that I deal with on a constant basis because I know that's the next wave. If I can get these kids to understand why they're here and, under, and understand the process that they're in, this game that they're playing, then we may be able to change the game. Until they understand the game, that they're in a game, we can't change the game. We can't win playing someone else's game. But we can get in the game and then change the rules until the game becomes ours. So that's, that's, that's where I am in a nutshell. I was married the first time for 23 years. Uh, I have three, kid, three girls from that marriage. Um, today is my middle daughter's birthday. She's 30, 33 today. Yeah, 33. Um, I have one son now from my marriage now. I've been in this marriage for, uh, geez, 
<laughs> I'm trying to figure that. 50, 16, 15 years. Yeah, 15, 15 years now. So, it, yeah, it gets up in there. You're like, wow, it's kids, marriage, the whole thing. You start, start remembering this a whole lot going on, you know, a whole lot going on. And I'm involved in so many different civic organizations and, and activist organizations and, you know, political fights. I'm suing the city. I'm, gonna, I'm suing the, the city of Austin. I'm suing the, the Central Health District, um, you know, be, because we need to fight for that which we haven't received. So there's a lot going on in my life and always has been. But it keeps me going. And, you know, so when people ask me, how are you doing? I said, you know, really have to categorize what that means. You know, personally, I'm doing fine. Politically, I'm, I'm on fire. Uh, tell me a little bit about, if you can, about your uh, lawsuit against the city of Austin. The city of Austin um, has historically, and I think this goes with all cities for the most part, I think we need to understand how budgetary uh, constraints hinders our communities. But here in Austin, I was able to go back and do an open records request and, uh, and find out how much money they they divert into other processes like AIS, the, the, the independent school district of Austin, while leaving out the outlying areas. I live in, uh, in Del Valley. 50% of our students uh, in Del Valley are citizens of Austin. So I recently found that um, they give the city of Austin, which is a lot richer school district than ours by far, uh, although 50% of the students in Austin are in supposedly in poverty, over 70% of the kids in Del Valley are in poverty. So when you start looking at the numbers and also the amount of minorities that are in Del Valley, Del Valley is 95% global majority. 95 percent, uh, over 89 percent free and reduced lunch. So we've got massive amount of need that they were diverting money from the city budget into Austin's independent school district to the tune of $3.9 million one year and $4.6 million another year. At the same time, they were giving Del Valley $747 and $3,900. So the poor people of Austin that go to Del Valley are supporting the richer district. And that's, I mean, that's seriously a title, I mean, a, a, a fourth, 14th Amendment situation. That ain't, ain't nowhere close to equal, or even close to equal in there. So therein lies that the lawsuit, and that, that's gonna be filed. I'm suing the Central Health District right now from the standpoint that they're not giving, providing services in the Del Valley area. We have no facilities. Del Valley is 152, 172 square miles, and they've given no services, no Central Health care facilities, although we pay taxes and have been for the last 10 years, and everyone else has this, and they're talking about $200 million budgets, and we literally have no services. So we filed a lawsuit back in November, and that's why supposedly they're going to bring us something now, supposedly. So I'll see it when they break ground. Okay. Thank you. So tell us today, why, why do you want to tell us your story? Why do you want everyone to hear your story? I think that and I deal with people like this all the time. I think until someone who is totally disconnected from the pain of discrimination and racism hears the stories, understands the stories, and just to hope that it will break through and get some empathy and compassion so that you create more allies and more, more soldiers who will fight for the people who have been left out of the mix, who've been kept in the margins, uh, disenfranchised, that you'll bring more of the people who are part of the mainstream, who, who can speak better to truth to power, because I think the reality is, right now, when black people scream at power, power doesn't care, in fact, it laughs. So until we get to the point where we can go to them and bring the quote-unquote allies to the front, and they start screaming at their parents and their bosses, and, those, and they start making that noise, us screaming at them doesn't do any good because we literally are being laughed at. And I, that, that, I'm hoping that this, that this process will create the stories that create the empathy and compassion and the outrage that should happen so that people get on the front lines and, and start talking about what sacrifice actually means. Because every day I'm sacrificing something by living in America. Okay. So can you share with us, or will you share with us, a story uh, of your personal experience as it relates to being put in a situation of racial discrimination. I, and it's, and it's, even that's hard. Like I said, I, I got a paddling in fifth grade. I mean, as a five-year-old, a six-year-old, I got a paddling. 
So how do you, how, how do I, as a six-year-old, process just wanting water? And you're at school as an unthinking, thing, you see a grown man here, but think about it, the size of a six-year-old who is being drug off. And in this case, it was drug off by the ear, where they put the fingers in your ear and hurts and drug away and then paddled because you drank from the wrong water fountain. That's at an early age. But as you, as you go along, and I've sued several companies behind the, pro the process of being discriminated against, and you have to understand, we have to prove. The reality is we know that discrimination exists, but you have to prove that discrimination happened to you and then have someone talk, tell you that, oh, well we'll, well, we'll pay you off to go away, but we won't stop the discrimination. In the case of where I am right now with Burlington Lone and Santa Fe Railroad, for four years, I put up with crap that is difficult for me to even process now. I remember certain instances where they, um, I remember being timed to go into the bathroom once. This is, the building was huge. And I, I worked a late night shift. Every night I would have to come in on a mid shift and clean up from the from the young woman who was who worked in the in the, in the booth before me. Her, her her my territory was terrible. It was one of the most difficult territories to work. <clears throat> they knew that. And every night I had to come in and ask, "How bad is it? How bad is it?" And they knew it was bad. It was like, well, get him in there. He's the best we got. Go clean that up for us because she's on the verge of killing somebody. And one night, this young lady forgot to give track warrants out to a train about where a area was that had to slow down. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but trains that don't slow down in certain areas will run off the track. And she forgot to give them the track warrant. And I found out about it when I got in with her. And that's literally a it could be a fireable fence depending on how many times you've done it. <clears throat> but I got there, and I'm listening, uh, talking to the train out there. and said, you know, here's a track warrant. Something happened. <clears throat> and a, I'm sorry, a division superintendent was listening on the radio. They're here they're listening to what we're doing. And they literally came after me as if I was the one who did the, the problem, as, like, as, as if I was the problem. And he told them, go find something that was wrong. I said, wow. So I, I was suspended for 20 days without pay. What was the race of the, of the young lady? Oh, they, they found out later on and suspended her for 10 days without pay. But they suspended me without pay, not because of the fact that I cleaned up the mess, but because they listened to my phone call where I had called up my now wife and I was cussing about the fact that she had done that to me. And they said, well, you were cussing on a recorded line. I said, Wait a minute. You're not worried about the fact that this woman has somebody killed, but you're worried about the fact that I'm on a private phone call that you should have by law clicked off of because it had nothing to do with the railroad. And you take my money away from me for 20 days. And in the in the depositions, in the in the trial that we had, basically this is what it was, the trial. The, the, the union boss asked him, he says, so y'all were on a fishing mission? And they said, yeah. You had nothing wrong. I hadn't done anything wrong. But you went on a fishing mission to find something I did wrong. So the whole process that we go through as black people in America, we need to understand that even when we're right, we're wrong. And that's what, what they've proven to me with this lawsuit. Because the lawsuit goes further. When I sued them, as we're going through the process, I brought the first suit. They then said, if we negotiate with you, you have to leave. Not we'll straighten up or, 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 or clean up our behavior. you got to leave. Wait, that's illegal. That's retaliation. They don't care. All day is, it's retaliation. They didn't care. I have, I have it written down. They said it in a deposition. They showed it to them. This, this is what we said. Textbook retaliation. Okay. So then in this settlement, as I'm leaving the job, 
I said, so you want me to leave the job, but I don't want to go, but I'm having to go because I don't have any other options? Well, I'm not going to sign something that says I can't come back to work. The only reason I was thinking about coming back to work was because my wife at the time was a um, director. Well, at the time, she was a manager of a reservation center in San Antonio, and I knew there's a possibility she might get promoted and move to Dallas. I said, well, I always want the option of coming back. Once you all clean up your act, and I'll come back here and go back to work. Well, that wasn't part of the agreement. It also wasn't part of the agreement that I would never do it. They just wanted me out. So in the agreement, it says I would, re I would retire. And I signed the agreement. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I did not sign the agreement. It was read into the record. There is no signed agreement. My wife was promoted the next week. I said, well, no reason for me to quit now. I'll go back and still take the slings and arrows, and we'll just keep on with this lawsuit. I go back to the job. They said, you, you, we have an agreement that you'll never come back here to work again, which is not, there is no such agreement. And it was in the seven days that is statutory by Constitution that I can do that, mm -hmm. that I can reject it. And it was in writing. They didn't care. And the judge didn't care. And the judge has used the fact that as a white man in America, their word counts more than both my word and my attorney's word. They said to me in writing, well, as long as they believe the reason they're firing you, the reason they won't let you come back to work is not discriminatory. As long as they believe it's not, it's good to go. And for 18 years, I said, you fired me without cause. Your belief means absolutely nothing up to and including the fact that Burlington or the Santa Fe Railroad, V. White, said in 2005 that it does not matter what the employer says. It only matters what the employee says, myself being the employee, the judge does not care. The Fifth Circuit doesn't care what the Supreme Court said. So discrimination in this country, when I tell you they don't care about even the law or the laws, it doesn't matter. Because as a black man, you got no rights. It goes back to the Dred Scott decision. As long as a white man's got it, a black man has nothing. And that's, and that's where we are in this process. So after 18 years, I'm telling people, I'm going to file again because I was fired without cause. I'm going to continue to fight this. And I've tried to get all these equal rights and people out here, all the EJI and you know, Civil Rights Commission and all these other people who supposedly fight these, these battles. I said, this is the battle right here. My lawsuit is at the American Bar Association as a way to beat discrimination lawsuits right now. Franklin B. Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railroad is at the American Bar. If you Google it, it comes up. And if you look at it and go, wait a minute, that's not the way this went down. It's not true. Franklin B. BNSF, that's not what happened. I didn't take $150,000 because I walked away from the job. I took $150,000 because they wouldn't let me go back to work. And you kept me out of my job for over two weeks. I got three kids, two of them are going to college. You got this is crazy. So what happens in our country is we get in this country, we get in a position where we have no options. So it looks as if because we had no options, what we did was, well, you shouldn't have done such. I had no options. Black people get no options so often in America that we don't even talk about it. And, you just, and, and then we blame each other. That's why I have a real problem with the church piece, because the church piece makes people blame each other and then take that burden along with us as if that person is messed up. And I look at people and that's not what happened. That's not who we are. Why do y'all judge each other that way? Why do we judge each other that way? Why do you believe we do? We have been told. We have been indoctrinated. We have literally taken on the mantle of white supremacy and applied it to our own people. We do it consistently. One of the reasons I stopped going to church is because I saw so much judgment in the church. I said, you know what? I ain't seen not one of y'all ever go out there and grab them bums out there on the street, them, them, them dudes out here with they ain't got no. It, bring them in here. Let them hear the, the, the good news. The good news ain't with them out there in the hallway. It ain't down the street with them. Go get them. The unwashed, the unkept. Bring them into the process. And then you can talk to me about who I am and what I'm about. Because I'm going to go right down here in a minute and talk to them. As soon as I leave out the building, I'm going to holler at my boys down here. How do I help you? Do you want help? What do you, what do you need? How can I be part of your world? How can I uplift? How can helping you help me? How do, how do we change this conversation? But that's not what's happening in those four walls every day. And I couldn't deal with the fact that that's not what we're doing. I said, you know what's really funny? If Jesus Christ himself came up in here right now dressed the way he did, you wouldn't let him in the doors either. 
and you wouldn't let him into UT and get a degree here either because nothing he did was academic. You may sense a, a little bit of anger here. It's a lot of anger. It's a lot of anger because I've been feeling this for so long for so many people that people are mad at me. And I said, you know what, if I'm you're making you mad, I'm probably doing the right thing. Because as I remember, y'all hung Jesus Christ on a cross because he was telling y'all to change. You put him on a cross because he said, you know what, y'all got to be better than this. As long as he was doing the good work, it was cool. As long as he was raising the dead, as long as he was out here feeding the hungry, as long as he was doing the work, it was cool. But as soon as he turned around and said, oh, and by the way, you saw what I just did? Y'all going to have to do better, too. Oh, no, we're not doing better. We got to go. And I'm like, I don't understand how you don't understand that what we're being called to do is better by each other. And as soon as you say that to somebody, look at who do you think you are? And that's what I've been getting. Who you think you are? I said, I'm just like you. I just want us to be better. I want me to be better. I want you to be better. I want us to be better. And I know we are. And when I do that with children in my program, they get it. So I only deal with children because I realize adults, we are jacked. We can't change. We refuse to change. But them kids, they, we got, still got hope. New hope. <laughs> Old hope. I got hope. <laughs> Greater hope. <laughs> your experience in, with the uh, railroad? That was just one. I get some more. <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken, same thing. Jack in the Box, same tell, thing. Tell me about Kentucky Fried Chicken. Jack, so, so, let me tell you what's really funny. <laughs> Kentucky Fried Chicken's on the east side of San Antonio over in New Braunfels. I walked in the store. I, a gentleman by the name of Ron Bullitt was my, was my, was my boss, he, and I just started with the company. And he said, uh, how do you feel about a challenge? I said, I ain't, I'm not afraid of anything but other than heights. <laughs> so he said, well, well, let me show you something. So he takes me down to New Braunfels, San Antonio. We go into Kentucky Fried Chicken. I never forget this girl's leaning back across the counter named Shirley. She's leaning back like, said, what y'all want? She went at the counter. She was just chilling. I was like, wow. Now, she didn't know that he was the area manager and I was going to be the new manager. She had no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was just chilling. Everybody in the store was chilling. It was some of the slowest service you ever want to see in your life. Chicken was old. Coleslaw was outdated. It was tore up. KFC. KFC. KFC on New Braunfels. New Braunfels and New and, and MLK. You know, it used to be around away from there. It used to be a Chinese restaurant. They closed it up. I know you know. I was there. I was there for four years. I was the stuff. For four years. I, I blew it up for four years. Mm, mm -hmm. Seriously. For four years, we took, we, we smoked everybody. But before I got in the store as the manager, the store was tore up. I mean, it was filthy. Floor had, it was dirty, it was filthy, and the people in there act like they wanted to be part of that process. He said, I'm going to put you down here as the manager. I said, but you got two managers down here already? He said, yeah, I know Mary's down here and John's got to go. We send managers down here to be fired. Wow. Well, how does that make you feel? If you I don't care. You. you don't tell me. I tell you. I don't care. Because okay. my people are better than this. He said, you ready for a challenge? I said, I'm good to go. So I walked in the door. And he, he made me the assistant manager. I'm underneath Mary and John. I said, we need to have a team meeting. He said, okay. Team meeting. Let's, let's, we're going to have one Sunday. Let's, let's do this piece. So everybody shows up early. We show up on Sunday. And John spoke. He's a drunk. John Hartfield, never forget it. Mary spoke. She was towed up. And they did their same old thing, you know, what they do. Rah, rah, blah, 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 blah. I said, y'all, I don't care what they just said. When I'm in the store, we're going to be right. We're going to get it right or you're going to get out. Because the people in this community deserve better. And if you ain't right, expect to be fired if I'm in the store. I'm sorry, what was the demographic makeup of that area? The okay. store, everybody over there was black and Hispanic. The whole area. There were no white people, none. Now, we got white people that came in from the base who ate in there for lunch. But where we, you know, that area is all black and Hispanic. So that's who was working in there. And I never will forget it. 
girl named Sil uh, uh, Sylvia, uh, Cecilia Hernandez, she said, the first time you spoke to us, I hated your guts. I, she like that, I hated your guts. And I was like, wow, now this is two years after the fact. I said, but did you notice the first time when we come out there with that QSC, that cleanliness, that quality service and cleanliness award, and you got 103 and y'all hadn't passed in six years? The first time you passed with 103, meaning not only did you get the food out and it was tight, but he got it within the 32nd time frame? Did you notice how you walked around like, we the stuff? Did you notice how for six months in a row after that, that we got the highest scores, of QSC scores in the entire region, six months in a row and people were finding out how we, what we was doing? Did you know how that made you feel? We was kicking it. In fact, the Martin Luther King parade used to let off right there in front of the, we, used to, we locked the doors back. We, 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 we taped the doors back. We got so tight, the sales started going up. 33%, I got the President's Award two years in a row for sales increases of over 33% over the year before. Two years in a row in the declining market base. So I'm kicking it. I'm sleeping on the floor. I'm doing whatever I have to do to make this better and showing people how this has to be done. I'm cleaning up. My boss and the area manager came down one time, Friday night. Now I'm dealing with the ETGs. I'm dealing with the roughest stuff. You, you, I know you know who I'm talking about. The ET, East Terrace gang was down there, Buggy and the group. I'm, I'm dealing with them. In fact, every night we had to wait for somebody to go to the, the uh, uh, um, this is before cell phones, by the way. This is, this is 90s. We had to go across the street to the, to the, to the telephone booth, stand there by the phone, ready to call as we left the building every night. That's what we was dealing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was tough. I, and I told, as I sued them, I told them I have a gun in two places in, my, in, the, in the store right now. I have a gun like, like the Godfather. I got one over behind the, behind the, 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 the restroom, in the, in the restroom, behind the toilet. I got one taped in there. And I got one in the main office. You shouldn't have guns here. I said, I am my own security. I don't know what you're talking about. We had security measures. Well, he said, if somebody come in the door act the fool, first you fall back to his, this place, and then you fall back here and grab the pot and throw hot water. And then you, you, we had seriously measures set up to deal with our situation. But what I also noticed was we cleaned up the store in a way that people started respecting who we were and what we were about. Sales went up. I went to start talking to schools. We adopted schools. We did all this stuff. The area manager came down for Martin Luther King, David Price, never forget it, Martin Luther King parade. We taped the doors back. We served over 700 customers in three hours. No cars, drive-through and two registers. And we were pumping chicken. He ain't never seen nothing like that before. Now, at the time, I was complaining about the fact that I hadn't been promoted. My sales off the chart. I'm the best in the, I'm the, best in the district. I'm the best in the state, possibly the best in the country. The president of KFC came to see me at my store. Want to know what, and then they, then they sent the people in to start investigating what was going on. And one woman said, you know, they're never going to promote you out of here. You're too good at what you do here. Sales off the chart, I made more money in, in six months time than everybody else did in, in a whole year. My net profit was off the chain. I'm, everybody else is trying to get to 14%, I'm at 17.7, the average was 7.7. I'm at 17.7% net profit. Nobody else is even close throughout the entire country. They sent people in to start investigating me, ask questions, Why, how's he doing this? And, she said, you're not going anywhere. I said, well, so I can't get what everybody else get. I can't get promoted to even an area manager and show y'all how to do this. Mm -mm, they're not going to move you. I said, well, I've had enough. I'm coming with a lawsuit because my numbers say I'm better than everybody else you've got right now. And I didn't win the award for the, for the district. You gave it to the white girl down the road. And I have numbers in my, in my garage right now to show you. She was nowhere close to being as good as me because the way you manipulated the numbers, you made her look good. You can't make me look bad, though. So they didn't promote me, and I sued them. They then tried to retaliate by trying to have the girls in the building say I was harassing them. I said, say what? Oh, yeah, they said, you, you know, you, you sexually harassing us, blah, blah, blah. So I said, you know, really? You know, we, we had that banter. We had that conversation. But we, I ain't harassed no women because I don't need to. I don't know what y'all talking about. I said, so what they say I said? What they failed to understand was we were family. I said, I'll tell you what you do. You tell them because they were threatening these young ladies to, to say this about me or they lose their jobs. I said, put that on paper and have it notarized. I have the notaries at my house right now. That's what they do to us. 
when they think they when they when they when they think they're in trouble, they try to change the rules and use their power to do it. And we need to understand how the game gets played. And I'm in Austin, I'm in I'm in San Antonio, and my attorney doesn't even show up for the 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 tete a tete the the the, the Mediation we were supposed to have, but the mediator was there and they were there and I was there because I had my own business I don't need no attorney. I sued him too Got his license suspended for a year Because that's what I do. I don't play He was not he didn't show up and I rocked his behind too We're in the mediation and the mediator is looking at the numbers. He's talking to them. He's talking to them He looked at the numbers. He said I got a question Just, Out of character. I got a question if he's doing this why are you trying to fire him and not put him out on the road and show everybody else how to do this? They had no answers. And I tell people this all the time. White folks would cut off their nose to keep a black man from getting ahead. They've done it before. Even when they know it would help them, they don't want you to be number one. That ain't the first time it's happened to me. Same thing happened to Raymond James. I was Raymond James as a financial advisor. Same, exact same thing happened. I'm shutting down a $27.5 million deal. I'm about to roll it over. I'm four days away from rolling over the best deal, the biggest deal they're going to have. I'm going to be number one on the floor. In fact, I need that corner office. I done told them. I'm going to need that corner office when this is done. And they fired me. They said, you took too long. You took, we don't believe you're going to get the deal. They thought they was going to be able to walk in the door and close the deal out. Because the deal was done where they were going to fly down to, to Raymond James, uh, headquarters in, in Tampa Bay and have the, you know, the dog and pony show where they show you how wonderful they are and everything they do. And we have a 97% close rate when we are able to take the clients to Raymond James and show them what we're about. Yes. Who's Raymond James? Raymond James is a financial institute. They're actually the, the biggest uh, financial advisors for the football, for NFL. They're the, 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 the football guys. So Raymond James Stadium is where the Tampa Bay Buccaneers play. So we're at Raymond James in Tampa Bay. They're gonna take. We're gonna show. We're gonna take this this large law firm down there and show them the dog and pony. And they got a twenty seven point five million dollar deal to roll over. And I'm about that far from rolling over. It's taking me about four months to put this deal together. It's taking too long. But if I get it rolled over, I'm gonna be the number one salesperson on the floor. I'm gonna have twelve hundred clients, all in a law firm, and I'm gonna get two hundred seventy thousand dollars on this rollover to my pocket. But I'm gonna need that corner store, corner store down there, that corner office down there on Shepherd Mountain, where it oversees downtown. I'm gonna need that office. They're not having that. You're not gonna be the top dog up in here. So instead of you letting me do what I do, you fire me under the guise of, well, we don't think you're gonna get the deal done. It's been for you. It's just taking too long. Really. And I got fired, and I sued them, and I got money. What happened to the deal? Oh, Who they closed? thought they they thought they were gonna close up and, and call up the people I had to the, the they called me and the, yo, I'm no longer at Raymond James. Yeah, y'all can close that deal down, click. Don't be stupid. The deal was behind the relationship, not what y'all are doing. They didn't care about Raymond James. They cared about the fact that I had gone out and played something. I don't even play golf. I'm out here golfing with these clowns, drinking, drinking whiskey and, and smoking cigars. I don't do either one. <laughs> but to get this deal, I'm going to be a whiskey drinking, cigar smoking somebody because that's part of the game. And that's what happens. They cut off their nose, a $27 million deal, 1,200 new clients coming in, and you close off that deal to make sure I didn't get it so that you didn't have to worry about me being the number one dog on, on the floor this year. I understand. They hurt themselves, and by the way, they were both got fired within a year. The two gentlemen who fired me were both gone within a year's time. You cannot run free as long as you're blocking the door from me. You can't go nowhere as long as you got your foot on my neck. You can't run either, fool. Okay. Um, so after these, I mean, you've had many experiences. Oh, more you know. <laughs> I can't, I, because I, I, I know I've had these experiences because my father told me, son, you're that person. You're always going to have this issue because you refuse to allow authority to just be authority. I challenge authority. Where does your authority come from? I was going to say something downtown. We were talking about this conversation today. My issue right now is, is we're talking about education, 
without understanding what education really means. We, you know, I, the fact that we denigrate people who don't have college degrees, the fact that we look down on people. I said, Jesus Christ didn't have no college degree. How do y'all go? How are you going to judge me when the first person that got a Ph.D. got it from somebody who didn't have one? That makes no sense. I'm in a car that's driving down the road and the car breaks down. I'm not looking for a dentist. I'm looking for a mechanic. Everybody has a value. And when I get out here in this world and I start talking about the fact that I have a value and I'm not, not going to let you take away from my value, the people who think they are valued more than me get upset by that. And by the way, that's not just a black thing or a white thing. That's a power structure thing. And those who support that power structure. And it, to me, the reason we have the problem we have right now is we refuse to approach the power structure and saying your power structure is hurting the majority of people in this country, in this world. The way you have the power structure set up needs to be addressed from the standpoint of everything. Every institution needs to be questioned. Every structure needs to be questioned. Why do you exist? And what have you done to make sure that you lift up mankind through that existence? And we don't do that. We don't want to do that because the existence of this structure helps me be who I am. We, we identify with that and not with each other. So it's always going to be a problem. So how have your experiences allowed you to deal with others? Um, it depends on the situation. Um, I've been quite successful in some things. Uh, I probably could have made my personal life a lot easier if I wanted to. But the struggle keeps me going. Because I realize that once I get comfortable, people are going to suffer. And somebody's got to fight for them. So I've made people mad who've come back to my way of thinking. I've made people right here at UT mad who've come back to my way of thinking 10 years later, right here at UT. Can you please explain that? I've called people on the nonsense of them saying, well, we just have to do our thing and we can write somebody a check. And I, and I keep saying, it's not the money that's the issue at the end of the day, it's the relationship, it's the, what you do with the money. But it happened because I was at one of these my brother keepers conversations. And in the My Brother's Keepers conversation, there was 135, 140 black men in the room. And during that conversation, they had two young black men who stood up and told, said at the time, we have, uh, let me tell you my story. It was painful. But what I heard in the story was, they had taken a very negative situation in their own community. Two of them, one of them had their brother get killed and some other stuff, blah, blah, blah. And the other one had gone and done 10 years in jail. And both of them said the same thing. When they needed a man in their life, the man in their life was a drug dealer and not someone like me at three o'clock in the morning. And I said, did y'all not hear? Because both of them had gone on to become, you know, academics and higher education and master's degrees and all this. So everybody in the room is, is cheering. Wee! We got two people who went and got high. They got degrees and stuff. They got masters. And they, woohoo. I said, that brother did 10 years. Did y'all not hear where the problem was here? The problem was the fact that the brother did 10 years. The brother was out here, he got his brother killed. We lost somebody. We lost 10 years and we lost some, we lost some, we lost. Y'all are cheering that win? I'm looking at the loss and why it happened. And at three o'clock in the morning, where were y'all? The answer is in this room. The answer is not waiting for somebody to tell me 10 years after the fact, I'm gonna save that man. The answer is at three o'clock in the morning, can he knock on your door, can he call your phone and say, say man, I need some advice. I need some help. Because at three o'clock in the morning, that's what I'm writing in my book right now, is at three o'clock in the morning, Michael Sterling called my house. I said, Mr. Franklin, I'm about to be a daddy. And I said, I know you hate your daddy though, right? What kind of man you gonna be? At three o'clock in the morning, I said, Michael Sterling, what kind of man you gonna be now? Because he needs to hear from a man what a man should think about right now when he's about to make that decision of what kind of man he's going to be. He don't need somebody to write him a check to an organization that will be there tomorrow at 1 o'clock for two hours. Because at 1 o'clock for two hours, that kid already made his mistake last night because he's not even here. He's in jail. At 3 o'clock in the morning, that brother need to hear from you. Not the organization that's going to go down tomorrow run by some little white woman who's there to make everybody feel good. He need to hear from y'all. So the 135 people in this room are the answer. Not that check, not that organization. They're us, they're us. 
and we need to be present and we need to stop dropping our bucket in somebody else's community and get back to where we were. I said, how many of y'all willing to sacrifice to help these kids? And I say sacrifice. I'm like, how much you willing to sacrifice? And look at me all funny. I said, how many of y'all live in the neighborhoods where all these problems are happening? How many of y'all live in my neighborhood? I've had money. I didn't move. I know people who had money. And the first thing y'all do when y'all get a little bit of money is you go somewhere else. You take your talents and skills somewhere else. <clears throat> so some other community gets your talents and skills and your talents and skills are your children because you know your children do well because you're their parents. My son had an opportunity to go to St. Stephen's. They recruited my kid. He plays golf. He's real good and good looking kid. He's smart. He's on national debate teams and all kinds of stuff. You know who he's giving that talent to? Del Valley, where we're poor. And they didn't see this kid right there who plays golf, so he can go tell the eighth grader I talked to yesterday how to play golf. He takes his talent and skills and give them to somebody else, son, because that's how it's done. Don't take your talents and skills and give them to somebody else. Bring it back to the community and enhance who we are. Oh, oh you don't understand. I said, I don't understand. I'm in the community with, with a bunch of kids who need you. I definitely understand. But you're looking out for you, I got that. I'm glad your kid got a nice scholarship. Is it possible your kid could have taken two or three other kids with them when they got that scholarship? So my issue comes down to the fact that there are people that, that look like me who get upset by the fact that I call them on the nonsense. Because the reason we sold, the reason I have a problem with, with, with the Bose is because the Bose didn't tell the talent of tenth what the talent of tenth actually was. The talent of tenth means the 10% of y'all who are not suffering can go back and tell the other 90% how to not suffer. Not just the talent of the 10th who go gets an education at a UT or whatever the university might be. That talent of the 10th, that, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the talent of the 10th that go ahead and show me how to build a, a shed, how to fix a lawnmower, how to help a person pass mental health issues, how to cook a meal. The talent of the 10th is whoever got talent in our community, bring that 10% over here and give it to somebody else and show them how to lift up each other. When are we going to do that? And they look at me like I'm crazy when I say it. I'm like, I, I, I'm OK with that. Y'all put Jesus Christ on the cross when he told y'all the truth. I'm good with it. OK, so then speaking of Jesus Christ, how do you relate your faith to your experiences? Or do you relate your faith to your experiences? I'm going to tell you a story. I was raised in a Christian household. My mother is a devout Christian, one of the most evil persons on the planet. She can evil up some stuff. She can hate real hard. In fact, some of the days she hated the hardest was coming out of church. She'd come home from church and be mad as hell. I ain't know what, 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 did, what, what, have, what have y'all done to this woman? Seriously. But I, on the other hand, I always go to church to hear the message. I'm hearing, what is, what is you're saying to these people in this community that, that should move them to be better people? But I was in church right after I got fired from Raymond James, as a matter of fact. That's when it happened. And I'm in church, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, what did I do, A, that I'm missing this $275,000? What did I do? What, what happened? Where did I go wrong that I can't get this thing done that I should have got done and here I am on the outside looking down. I'm, I'm wallowing in pity. I'm seriously pitied out. I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. And Reverend Parker was right up in front of me. He was right up. I was sitting way back in the back, in the middle, in the open area. And he was up in the front. He was preaching. He was dancing about and carrying on. He was, he was shaking it down. He, he was throwing curveballs and carrying on. He was doing the whole piece. He was doing. He was, he was heated up that day. I don't know what. The, I don't remember what he said. He was on par. He was throwing it. But I was swallowing pity that day. I couldn't hear nothing he was saying. Because I'm asking God right now, God, why am I here? What happened? How am I going to take care of my kids when I'm 50 years old and you see what you just did to me? How am I going to take care of my children? I asked the question out loud in my head. And I tell kids this all the time. I said, you talk to yourself all the time. You don't recognize it. But I guarantee you, you've heard a voice in your head. You, 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 you use it sometimes. I'm going to start using that voice on you more often. I use the voice in my, that day because I asked God that question. And right as I said that to myself, there's a little baby 
in one of them rockers with the handle that folds up like that. And she'd been sleeping. The lady was a you know, nice looking girl right here. And she had the baby and she was rocking. The baby was doing like this. And right as I said the words, that baby like this and looked at me. And the eyes was about this big. I could see the baby looked through me, at me, and said to me, what about me? I said, damn. And I started to cry. And my body got hot. And I said, damn. Everything I have done to this point in my life has been for the wrong purpose. I have been led to this part in my life to do more than I've been doing all my life. I've been led to this part right this moment to change something for that child because they're all my kids. And as soon as I realized what that child said to me, I lifted up out of my body and saw myself and I was ashamed of how I had lived my life and what I had been doing to that very moment. And everything didn't matter before that. It only mattered for here going forward. <sighs> and I saw this body that I was in. It was clear. It was, it was bodiless. It was me looking at a body and looking at every other body. And then it became clear that, thank you, that I was, that, I, that we, had a, we were misunderstanding. We, everything in the room was touching. It was like the matrix. Everything in the room was moving and touching at the same time. The floor, the sofas, the, the chairs, the people, the lights, the air, I could see everything like it was touching and moving and realized it's all the same. It's all God given. This is God in the room. This is all it was all about. I got to make sure I do the right thing by this child no matter what. No matter what, I got to sacrifice myself because if I hurt this child, I hurt me. And that's what happened. So I told Reverend Parker at a Democratic convention, I stopped being a Christian in your church because I realized the God that y'all talk about is your God. It's a God y'all don't put in a book. It's a God you didn't put in your head. And the God that I know is so much larger and powerful than anything you guys can imagine. That you can't imagine it until you feel it. It's not something you know, it's something you feel. It is love. It's, it's, it's sacrificial love that there is no death. There is only love and the energy that that creates. And when you realize that you can do anything, you're not afraid anymore. So I am fearless. I cannot be killed because there is no death. There is only love and God is love. And when you realize that, you can go and take anything on because you are not afraid anymore. I talk to my kids about fear. What are you afraid of? And they go, I don't know, but you're afraid. You don't know where even the fear is. So I'm dealing with these kids after that because what happened was, let me tell you what's really funny. I don't know what I did. I don't know what happened, but I went home. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got it. I understand. Now what? Now what? That evening, a lady named Dr. Reeling, Karen Reeling, <laughs> called me on the phone. She said, uh, Mr. Franklin, I saw you talking to Michael Lofton's group the other day, and I was just wondering, can you come talk to my kids? I know this woman, Madam. I was like, what? Now I'm unemployed. <laughs> so I said, uh, sure. <laughs> this must be, this must be it this must be it this woman don't know me from anybody she said can you come talk to my kids I said absolutely when did you need me without question without hesitation fearlessly unapologetically 
She said, well, I can put together the guests. Can, can you come down Thursday? I said, whatever you need me, I'll be there. That Thursday, I woke up in the morning realizing I had to go there. And uh, I'm not a prayerful person. I don't know nothing about prayer. I don't know nothing about any of that conversation. I don't care. But I was very afraid. I said, God, I ain't got this. I don't know nothing about this. I don't know what I'm going to do. Just guide these steps. <laughs> Lord, send me on the way you want me to be. You done told me to do this. Here I go. And uh, <laughs> I'm heading out that day about 1 o'clock to go talk to the kids. I'm in my little Corolla. I'm heading down there. And I panicked about halfway down to the school, coming to the middle school. I'm panicking. She said, I said to myself, uh, God, I don't know what to say to these kids. They should have said, come talk to these kids. I don't know what to say to these kids. You better give me something to say. I'm on, I'm, that, that was my prayer. You better give me something to say to these kids because I'm, I'm on the way down here. You told me to go. I'm going. But I don't know what I'm doing. I walked in the door. I started talking to these kids. I talked for over two hours. And I don't know what the hell I said. For two hours time, I don't know what I said. But at the end of two hours, I do remember saying, I don't know what we're going to do this year. But if y'all stay with me, we'll all be better men. I got through Tammy Lee Walker, one of the kids' mamas, still friends this day. She said, Mr. Franklin, they done sent a whole lot of people here to talk to our kids, a whole lot of programs, a whole lot of organizations, a whole lot of stuff talking to our kids. I ain't never trusted none of them. I trust my son with you. And I've been living with that ever since. And, and Tammy Lee's still, still a friend of mine. Her son, Jeremy, is... When I first met him, he was a little six foot, you know, a little butterball in the sixth grade. Now he's like six, six foot two and a half, you know, good looking kid engineer. But that's where my faith has taken me. My faith is different than the religious thing that everybody talks about. It's a, it's a knowing that gives me the faith process of changing the lives of these children. And I've, I've spoken around the country about it. Uh, you know, women say, we can't bring God to the classroom. I said, ma'am, if I'm in the classroom, I'm channeling. I bring God with me. So now this, this, and this is probably not my last question, but what part of your faith uh, addresses racism? I think what I kind of answered in the, in the last the last question. I think the reality is once you realize that we're all in this together then it changes the conversation. Because I've seen people who look like me who are racist because they're supporting the white power structure, the structure that keeps us where we are. I've also seen people who don't look like me who are 100% in the other direction, who are trying to dismantle the power structure as fast as they can, and you would never know it because we are always locked into strictly colorism on racism and not racist policies and practices themselves and the people who do those things. It's my contention that the people who decide they want to move up my neighborhood are just as racist as the people who are shutting me down financially. Uh, you, you want to move out of my neighborhood because you felt like the white man's ice was colder than, me, than ours. You went somewhere else because you, their neighborhood was better than yours. You didn't clean your neighborhood up. You went somewhere else where the neighborhood was already clean when you brought that down to the church piece. So the racism piece, as far as I'm concerned, uh, has to be addressed from the humanistic standpoint. We have to recognize the power of humans within what God has given us and make us all better to approach racism from the standpoint of eradicating it. But I can only do that if I see you as a human being that has value. I have value, you have value, he has value. We all have a value because God put us here for that reason. And I talk about the fact that I can show you the value of a paraplegic that literally can't move. I've seen it at action. I've seen God work in ways that you don't understand because you don't know how to count, count true blessings. Watch 
at a school where you see kids who bully each other, who play games with each other, who literally denigrate each other all day long. Watch the paraplegics in that wheelchair when he gets to that door over there. Watch the kids who are alpha mindset stop what they're doing and open the door for that kid. Push the kid out the door. Hang out with the kid. Because th that child over there needed the humanity in them today. And he brought it out. That's the humanity that overcomes racism. Because they don't care what color that kid is in the chair. That kid needs help. And they found their humanity to help him. That's what happens every day when, you, when we realize that God has a purpose for every one of us. And if we can do that, then we'll stop treating each other in racist, sexist, all the other isms. We'll stop. That's where the faith comes in of understanding why we're here when we find each other. That's how it changes. How do we do that? <sighs> I, 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 I think one of the reasons we do it right now is because we have been indoctrinated, we have been fooled, we have been sold, we have been media hyped. And what, we, what, I'm, what I'm working on right now myself, the reality is we have to start creating the narratives of us that are positive, that are uplifting, that are actually entertaining and uplifting about who we are because we are phenomenal. Human beings are phenomenal. We do phenomenal things every day. But we don't tell that story because if it, if it bleeds, it leads is the conversation. We always want to sensationalize and, and denigrate. We'd rather see the train wreck than the aerobatic process of an airplane. Ooh, someone died. Yeah, but look what they just did with that airplane. You know, it's, what, what, watch the juggler. You know, we, we don't see the phenomenal dancer, the, the, the person who can sing, look at that painting. We don't see the beauty in each other, but we can see the negative piece, and that's what we focus on because we think that's not as much fun. We don't, see as, we don't see the fun in each other. We undo it by creating the narrative that changes all that because the reality is we really do like seeing beauty. We like seeing, we like seeing great things. But until we start promoting that, seeing there's money in that, it's like I'm loving the Black Panther movie that y'all finally see a black king, but the fact that we had to kill another black king to make it happen kind of bothers me. <laughs> We didn't have to kill him. He didn't have to die. He could have been ostracized or made to be rehabbed. He didn't have to die. We don't have to kill each other when we're wrong. We don't have to kill each other. I know we have disagreements, but how do we get past that? That's who we really are. But my brothers, and I got news for you, I've been, cutting, I've been sliced and diced by a bunch of brothers. Brothers and sisters right here in Austin, Texas. Sliced and diced. Like he said, we don't, they don't even know why, why they hate you so much. Why, why are they afraid of you? Why do they hate you? I said, I don't care. That's their problem, not mine. I'm going to do what I'm going to do anyway. I was on the radio. I had a radio program with KZI. They took me off. I had a large following. <laughs> If you don't mind my yeah. asking, which program is that? I was a, a Thursday morning DJ. I, I was a, on the Thursday morning program. Uh, they do Thursday morning, you know, the conversations early in the morning. Um, Kenneth Thompson was a, was, a, was a partner of mine. Uh, <laughs> um, I've, I've done a little bit of everything. You know, I said, no, Rest Richard Smith talking crazy on, thir on Fridays. I'm Richard Franklin on, on, on Thursdays. I said, I'm the one who actually interviewed, you know, uh, the guy from the Miami Herald. I had an opportunity to, and here's the funny part, when they closed the radio station down in 2007, I had an opportunity to, to interview Barack Obama before he was president. I had him lined up, and they didn't even know it. So you shut me down, and I shut that down, dummies. That's what we do to each other. We don't recognize the power of someone else because we are so locked up in our own egotistical nonsense that someone who can do us some good, we don't even want that. We want to protect where we are. So the racism, as we understand it, it doesn't exist just in black against white. Oh no. White against Hispanic. It's every it's racism within the race right. that is perpetuated continuously to keep 
And this is just my thought. Yeah. It, it, that's keeping the other people up here right. in power. Well, and, 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 and here's the funny, but so you understand, so you okay. so you okay. understand, I, because I go, my, my life is way more complicated than anybody you've ever met. I've dealt with the Fortune 500 people in the, in the country. I, I came down, my wife got promoted, my first wife got promoted because I was friends with, with, with the president of, of Southwest Airlines. The chairman of the board, Herb Kelleher and I, were, we, we were good friends. Just happenstance. I used to hang out with Martin Frost from Frost Bank. Happens things. Just, just happen to meet these people. And just because that's who I am. That's what I do. I'm, I network. So I'm here, and I talked to a gentleman by the name of Pike Powers. He used to, used to be chief of staff for J.J. Pickle. He was also the congressman uh, where Lloyd Doggett sits now for a while. But he's, he was running the show here for, for a second. He offered me a whole bunch of money one time. He didn't say the, the, the he didn't say the word money, but the, what he was offering me was was quite lucrative. And I knew that as soon as he, I said yes to what he was saying, because at the time I hadn't pissed off anybody in Austin. This is early. This is like 2002, 2003. I hadn't, I hadn't stepped on everybody's toes yet. I, I hadn't hit the scene yet here in Austin, Texas. I had already done stuff in San Antonio and, and Fort Worth. I, but I hadn't acted a fool here yet. I was just getting my feet wet because I owned a, night, I owned a, a restaurant here. I was a wing zone. That's why I, I, I moved here to... to to, to cook chicken wings, wings on 24 in San Gabriel. I built that. He offered me a whole bunch of money. But the first thing he said out of his mouth when, he, when we sat down to have coffee at uh, Starbucks on 6th in, in Congress, he said, what do you want? Now, I'm, I'm not as young as he thinks I am. I've been around. I know what, I know what that means. I said, well, I'd like to see my community uplifted. And you can see the look on his face because it wasn't the normal, because if they understand, if power understands, see, we think it's just straight racism. No, racism is not just racism. It's also a matter of power. If power knows where your weakness is, what button to push, it will push that button for you. If I said, I want a, uh, I want a Maserati, he'd have got me a Maserati. If I'd have said, well, I want a whole bunch of money, he said, they got me a whole bunch of money. He said, well, you're a financial advisor. I said, yeah, I'm a financial advisor. He said, well, you know. When I said that, he said, well, let me show you something. I have the paper at the house right now. So it's on a yellow, he brought a yellow pad out in front of me. He started drawing up something for HT. He said, if you could make this happen, HT could be like the UT of, he was all excited. Oh, dude, he was got, he got, he got, he got manic about it. Mm -hmm. I still had the paper at the house. I said, man, that could be tight. He said, no, no, you're a financial boss. I said, yes. You know, you can handle our accounts. Uh, I can introduce you to the COO of our account for Fulbright Jaworski over in, over in Houston. We only have about $325 million under management in our account. I just told you what a $27 million account looks like on a rollover. Mm -hmm. But I knew as soon as I said that, I am now his boy. And he was going to ask me to sell out the entire community. Now, let me tell you what's funny in retrospect. The community's already been sold out. Since that happened 15 years ago, and I look at what's happening in the east side of Austin, I should have taken the money. I should have taken the $3.2 million they would have put in my pocket, plus the almost $500,000 they would have put in my pocket every year after that. Because I could have saved some of those people from themselves. I could have started businesses on the east side. I could have invested on the east side to make sure those people were able to stay in their homes and create jobs and opportunities for themselves because there are people in positions of power in Austin that could have done it years ago and refused to do it because they have no vision, no understanding. So racism plays out in power. Racism plays out that way across the board. They use racism as just one of the ways it happens. It's, that's not the only ism that's used because if I can use sexism, if I can use racism, I can use any ism to separate and make sure that people are kept in their position. Power maintains itself. And those in power understand it. The rest of us don't. That's what's happening. That's, that's, that's how we change the game. We need to understand how the game's being played on us. But I, you know, people have no idea what some of us have sacrificed to maintain our positions. <laughs> to keep us right where we are. You know, and I do me right where we are. 
I've given up a lot to help these children. There's a whole bunch of times I could have walked away or should have walked away. I've had over 800, 800 kids through my program, and I've only worked in AISD, which knows my program works, two years. Out of the 12 years I've been doing this, 11 years I've been doing this. I've been in Hearn, Texas. I've been in Houston. I've been in Gonzales. I'm in Del Valley, but I'm not in AISD, and the program is ultimately successful. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking about on a whole nother level. I'm talking about taking black and brown children. I have the numbers to show people. I said, here's what, here my numbers are. I can take kids that you guys can't seem to get through to and get them to raise their test scores 10 and 15 and 20 percent, 20 points. The kids that you, at Covington Middle School when I first did the first year, by myself, with nothing, no assets, no resources, just a conversation on a constant basis. With these kids, their scores went up 15 to 22 percent. We outscored all the rest of the school that year. The black kids, the black boys that I got, 44 of them, outscored every other subgroup. And you would have said, well, with those numbers, they should have you everywhere. I said, yep, but, but they don't. Because power recognizes the fact that those kids right there start succeeding it will upset the balance of power. It will also upset the balance of money because there's a lot of money in, in failure. You, you, you know this. How many people are invested in the failure of our children? How much money is involved when our children don't succeed? Poverty pimps are everywhere and they come in every shade and every race, every color, every age group. They are invested in our children failing, and I am not. I told somebody the other day, I said, you give me $50,000, I'd throw $45,000 back in these kids' pockets every year because that's what has to happen. Someone has to believe in the kids and put everything they have into these children, and that's what I do every year. I tell people, I say, I literally survive on less than $14,000 a year right now. Right now. And even that, I still give kids money to read books, to do book reports, to do well in their grades. Kids come up to me, I say, I always keep $2 bills and $1 coins in my pocket, always. And they show me, Mr. Franklin, look what I just did. I got 99 on my, on my science test. Bam, here's a dollar, son. Cause there's money in them grades. There's money. I do a book report, who moved my cheese every year? I give $100 out for the best book report, $100. I do that in two different schools. I charge schools $7,000 to do this program right now. 7,000, I'm in three schools. Nobody's doing that. <laughs> yeah, so when I say, when, when, you, when you talk about how, how, how I'm hated, how much I've done to be hated, no, I don't care. Because when I- Because of your race, are you hated because of what you're doing? I'm, I'm, I'm hated because there's no filter. I don't do nice. I tell people, I, I tell myself, I don't have nice left. I don't have any nice left, I don't have, I have outrage. I have outrage because I'm outraged because you're not outraged. I have outrage because you aren't up as upset as I am with the fact that our children are dying. I have outrage because right now you're going out here marching because someone died because of a bomb, but you didn't march because people are dying out because they can't drink the water in my community. You didn't march because the fit people out here are not educating my children and they're dying in, in, in incarceration. You're not outraged by that. You're, you're only involved in, in, involved in events and not the everyday occurrence of us dying slowly on the vine. You didn't march because you didn't have health care in my community where 95% of the kids out there are black and brown. You didn't march for that. I ain't got no health care facilities. You didn't march when I didn't have, when I didn't have a, a, a bus. Where was you then? You didn't march because there was no money put in my community. Where's that? Where, there's no businesses. My kids are calling me every day, Mr. Franklin, well, you got something for me to do? I can't support a community, but I didn't see you marching because they don't have any. I see you guys out here doing stuff that makes you feel good, but not do good in my community. So when I go back and I go in these meetings and, and people are doing what they're doing, they get upset when I say, hold on a second, time. What y'all upset about? You ain't upset enough. Or what you upset about is nonsense. You just, you just, I, no. I'm upset about the fact that you are upset about nonsense. You are upset about an event and not the process. And when I call you on it, you get mad at me. Don't get mad at me, listen to the message. Because guess what? I'm going to still be here. When At the end of the day, I'm coming back and saying it again. I'm going to be part of it because I'll knock a door down. I'm not afraid of none of y'all. Like I said, I don't, I, I'm not afraid of death. There's no death. I'm coming. You want to kill me. And then, I, and then I left my son. I left some seeds behind. You're you going to have to kill them too. I'm coming. 
And when you recognize that, then you recognize who I am and it scares the shit out of you. It scares you because you realize that what I've left behind, you cannot kill. I got a whole bunch of kids out here who heard the message and they are all out here now. Over 700 of them are out in the streets. And they'll tell you right now, that ain't what Mr. Franklin said. Well, I didn't say it. God gave me that message. That was the word. That's the faith. And that's the scary part. Because the real word scares the crap out of folks. That's why they put him on the cross. Well, for real, this is my last question. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Because <laughs> uh, you've answered what I needed to know and even beyond, and I thank you for that. So as we wrap up, the, the final question is, do you have anything additional that you'd like to add to what you've already given us? No, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm so happy that Steve is doing this. I'm so happy that we're actually having an opportunity to speak about, and I hope that you get enough people in here to take the varnish off, because I was hoping some of my friends from UT, that some of the precursors would come in and talk about it on a whole nother level. In fact, I probably need to call one of them. But we've had, we have a, a conversation on Wednesday mornings at, at Mi Madres. We, I got two gentlemen who, one of them is a precursor, uh, you know, for, but they're the, the first black people who went to UT back in the, back in the uh, 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. The first people who came, and one of my friends died, uh, Gus, and we had the conversation about the fact that even being where they were, they were afraid to talk in, in again, unfiltered terms about their privilege, about what, A, their privilege was, but also what their privilege was not. Because when you hear them talk about it, you find that some of them are still living in the pain of even having had the privilege of going to UT first. Because they weren't allowed to stay on campus. They weren't allowed to do a whole lot of things. That, that white kid, well, guess what? That's almost happening now. But you hear them talk about it, and then you realize, you say, well, so when, you, when you're talking to someone who's understanding of their own plight, of their own situation, I said, so if you understand that, why are you not more angry and then hearing them say we're taught not to be and I said the same thing for my father my father was in the military at Hickam Airfield and jumped into a pool because he was not aware and they emptied the pool out and scrubbed it it's 1946 47 the day he got off the bus at Hickam Airfield, they said, today we're hanging a nigga. That was what they told every black person that walked off. They were hanging a black kid who had gone out with a white girl who was the base commander's daughter, and they hung him. Hickam Airfield, you never heard about that. So I realized that what we've gone through in our lives, and one of the problems we have right now is a lot of people are afraid to show that they're hurt and angry because we've been told that we can't let anybody know that we're hurt and angry. So we have tacitly allowed for and signed off on the behaviors that have caused us the pain. And I tell people now, and I'm gonna leave you with this, I am no longer going to act civilly until you treat me civilly. Don't expect me to walk in the door and not speak in loud, angry tones until you do something that makes me not angry and no longer loud about it. Then we can get real. But right now, you want to feel comfortable with my pain, and I'm not having it.